Happy Easter. Uh, happy Resurrection Sunday. Like Chris was saying before, really, uh, for, for many, for me certainly, like the, the highlight of the year, we do, we celebrate the resurrection, I mean, every week we talk about the cross and the empty tomb, uh, every single week, and uh, we live in light of it, certainly in, intend and try to live in light of it every single day, and, and then uh, like one time a year, we like to really just focus in on the resurrection, this most wonderful of promises and realities in which we live. It's really, man, it's wonderful. Um, if you're visiting with us today, uh, in particular, if you don't normally go to church, you don't really know what kind of it's about, or you've heard about Easter, or you know about the Easter bunny, or um, for whatever it is, I, I saw in the paper today, actually a good friend of mine from back in the day, uh, he was in the paper having to apologize to kids for accidentally revealing to them that the Easter bunny wasn't real, and then apologizing to these, uh, these poor kids. Anyway, <clears throat> oh wait, there's no kids in here, are there? Okay. <laughs> That's, we're cool, we're cool, no kids. Hey, hey, hey the little buddy. Um, so, uh, uh oh, is that Malaya? I'm so sorry, Malaya. Ruined, <laughs> ruined. Uh, the resurrection. <clears throat> let's, let's, uh, let's bring this sermon back to life. Uh, there's, this, there's this amazing story in John 11, and um, it's where Jesus, you know those kind of friends that you have, like uh, I have these kind of friends, you're not related to them, but their parents are kind of like, you call them, maybe you call them auntie and uncle in Australia. I know in other cultures, that's very common to call people you're not related to auntie and uncle. In Australia, it's kind of a special designation. Uh, if, you, if you are the parent and you have some friends and your kids call them auntie and uncle, or if you have friends and their kids call you auntie or uncle, that's really, that's, that's pretty special, right? You have a you have kind of closeness that is, uh, again, denoted by that special name. And Jesus had some friends that were kind of like that, not that we know of, related necessarily, uh, but very close. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are the name of these three kids. I mean, they're growing up now, probably around the same age as Jesus. And Jesus and them had this great and strong relationship. At some stage, they become friends, like really good family friends. And they talk to each other like siblings. They love each other like siblings. And one day, Mary and Martha send a note to Jesus. And they say, hey, Jesus, Lazarus is deathly ill. Please come. And Jesus, upon the news of this like desperate letter, uh, he says, let's chill out here for a couple of days before we go. So Jesus stays there. It's a short trip away from where Lazarus was, from where Mary and Martha lived. Short, short trip, a um, couple of miles, and so not very long. And yet Jesus stays where he is for a couple of days. And then he says to his disciples, say, well, we don't want to go because if we go back there, they were trying to kill us. If we go back there, that's not why Jesus was holding off. He, was, he intended to go. <clears throat> but he says, no, no, it's, you know, we're going to go. And then the disciples say, okay, well, we're going to come and die with you then. And then they go to be with Lazarus and with Mary and Martha, who'd been looking after their brother. Uh, Jesus, as he's telling the disciples, we'll, we'll read this next part in a minute. He's telling his disciples, we're going to go. He says, you know, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they're like, well, if he's, if he's just asleep, Jesus, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll rouse him and he'll be fine. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I mean, I was using that euphemistically. He's dead. And when they get there, that is in fact the news that greets them. And this is what verse 20 in John 11 says. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Imagine the, imagine the state, right? <clears throat> uh, they don't know that Jesus knows their brothers died. But they know their brothers died. They'd sent him later. They'd heard. They'd probably seen many, many, many stories of Jesus healing people from all kinds of things, delivering them from all kinds of evil spirits and oppression. And they're like, Jesus can help. If he can just get here in time, Jesus can help. And then Jesus arrives from a short walk away, days later, 
and the brother's dead. And then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So she has, she has faith in Jesus that he could do miracles. He could do miraculous things. And even on death's door, she had the trust in Jesus that he was who he said he was and could do whatever he wanted to do. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And so she is like, she's someone who, like us, she has faith in Jesus that at the last day when he comes again to rule and reign in his glory and authority, that we who belong to him will rise up with him. She, she's living in this reality. She says, yeah, Jesus, I acknowledge these truths that in the resurrection, he will, he will come again. But if he'd just come here earlier, he wouldn't have had to die now. We could have had more time with him. And then that promise would have still been a future promise we held out hope for, but we still would have a brother now. I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So he doesn't like, put his arm around her and say, don't worry about it. <clears throat> Death isn't really that bad. Your grief isn't really that grievous. Your brother didn't really mean that much to you. Consider all the bad times. He didn't try to make a silver lining out of it. <clears throat> he doesn't do, doesn't do any of those things. I mean, he did, he did cry with her. In, in a little bit, he'll cry with her. Instead, he just assures her that her faith is rightly placed on him. And he says, yeah, what you've said is true. I am the resurrection of life. Everyone who believes in me, even though he die, he will live. And so he's, he's, he's acknowledging the rightness in her faith, the prophetic nature of her statement. Saying, so yes, that's absolutely true. <clears throat> he says, do you believe this? And she says, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. And so in the grief of sorrow and of loss, Right in the, right in the, in the time of death, like time of grief, Jesus speaks these words of eternal hope to Martha, offering to her, to everyone that would listen, certainly to us as well, this promise that, that ultimately reshapes our relationship with death and it reshapes our relationship with life. And these words, they're not just, it's not just comfort, it's the foundation of our entire hope. This is even before he's, if, you, if you're aware of the story of Lazarus, spoiler alert, Jesus actually goes to the tomb. It's been four days. And it, Jesus says, roll the, roll the stone away. <clears throat> and Martha says, Lord, I love the way the KJV puts it. He says, he stinketh. Lord, he, he, he's been in there. He, his flesh is starting to deteriorate and rot away can't do it. And Jesus lifts up his voice to heaven and says, Father, uh, I know you can do this. I don't need to tell you this. I'm only saying this to you in front of everybody else so that they can hear it. And then he says to the dead man, Lazarus, come out. And he comes out. This would have been, I can only imagine the kind of emotion going through the people who were there. <clears throat> Probably, I think if I was there, fear would have been the first one. Fear at this, like, literally like a mummy coming out of the tomb. Fear at who is this man who speaks and dead people come back to life. Also, a sense of relief and awe of what have I, what have I witnessed here? Nobody can do this. We have <clears throat> phenomenal uh, medicine 
phenomenal uh, abilities in even you know in the natural in our day to to make someone come back from the dead after they've already started to like to rot to decompose uh, and especially back then without any kind of medicine holy moly phenomenal what is Jesus doing here in his claim he is first claiming and then demonstrating his power over death. He says, I'm the resurrection. So Martha says, yeah, I believe there's going to be a resurrection and the dead will rise with you sometime in the future. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is here, is what he's saying. I have the power over death. He's already shown his power many times <clears throat> over, over death. In fact, as he's raised people, he's shown his power over uh, the spiritual realm. He's shown his power over even creation. Every time, just with his breath, just with his words, he can command. He doesn't have to build something. He doesn't have to develop something. He doesn't have to use his hands. He just speaks and creation obeys his voice because he is the creator among us. Amen. And so he says, oh, I'm the resurrection. You're, you're right in your acknowledgement, your faith is rightly placed in me, but it's not just something that's going to happen. It's saying the resurrection is here. I am the resurrection, he says. I think this is why he didn't rush to heal Lazarus. Firstly, so that Martha could have this amazing statement of faith. What an amazing proclamation this woman made. Secondly, so that the power of God could be displayed. Thirdly, so that Jesus could show the relationship he had with the Father. To which, where he, again, he says, oh, I, don't need to, I don't need to say this, Father, but it's so that everybody else can see what's going on here. And then ultimately to show he is the power over death. He is the resurrection. This, this for, for us, what is an unavoidable certainty is overcome just by Jesus' breath. So we can't, Stop. We might be able to, with certain, you know, uh, lifestyle changes and you know medication and, and techno, you know utilizing some technologies and, and whatnot. We might be able to extend our life from our own perspective at least. But we can't stop death. And Jesus restores Lazarus to life. It's not a challenge for him. Didn't have to muster up his will. Didn't have to go away, didn't have to go and didn't have to go and do anything, just had to speak. Because he is the resurrection. The cross rightly gets our attention. Right? The cross gets our attention uh, because it's magnificent. What Jesus accomplished on that cross, dying the death that we deserved, paying our penalty, making us right with God. Not because we're awesome, but because he is awesome. Because of the great love and mercy he had for us. Jesus came for us. <clears throat> lived the perfect life we couldn't live. Died, a, died the death that we deserve. The one time for all time sacrifice. The perfect, spotless lamb of God. Without the resurrection, the cross is still good news for this life. Because it's good news without the resurrection, we, we've been made right with God who loves us. But it's, it's not great. It's not great news. The resurrection without the cross is terrifying news. We're going to live forever, but we're enemies with God? Terrifying news. But the cross with the resurrection is, that's the good news. That's, that is wonderful. Worthy of our meditation and rumination worthy of uh, encouraging one another and, and singing about. And this, again, we do this every single week because this is amazing. He is the resurrection. Not only that, Jesus says, uh, I am the life. I am the resurrection. So I have the power over death. Although you die, you will live. <clears throat> and he says, I am also the life. So it's not just about a future hope. This is, where he's, this is where I think he's gently bringing a correction to Martha's statement. He says, yes, 
the resur- I am the God of the resurrection, but I am presently the resurrection and presently the life. So the, the, we actually live in the power of the resurrection now. This promise isn't just about a future hope. It establishes an eternal perspective for every Christian that starts now. This is why Jesus says uh, at the beginning here, he says, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. So he's speaking to the present situation. Lazarus has died, but he's going to live. And he says, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. So he makes it even better. We're saying this, this kind of death isn't ultimate anymore. In our perspective, this death isn't the death that we need to worry about. He says, I am the God over death. So there will be a resurrection, but we can live in the light of the resurrection today. He says, I am the life as well. In Jesus, the power of death has lost its sting. Knowing that our future is secure in Christ, living in the certainty of the resurrection actually changes how we live today. And if we look at every believer who was with Jesus at this time, who remained with him until he rose again, until I saw him in his resurrected state, when they saw him in his resurrection, all of these believers would radically reorient their relationship to death and to life. All of the apostles, we looked at this the other week, all of the apostles, even the one that, that they you know, draw straws to uh, replace Judas, even, even him, they were all going to die for their faith be incredibly persecuted, treated horrifically, and every single one of them walks that path with joy, knowing that the Jesus who loves them has overcome even death. So it's not just a promise for the future, it's a promise for right now. The cross gives us hope for life, so restored friendship with God, your penalty paid Jesus' righteousness applied to you, your sin taken to him. The resurrection gives us hope for the next life, but starting now. You are a new creation now. You have a new nature now. He's given us a new heart, heart of flesh now. Sealed with the Holy Spirit now. We have all of these benefits now. And the Spirit, even as a deposit that Jesus is coming back, like the guarantee, we're guaranteed of the eternal life with Jesus, of life everlasting and life to the full with him because of the Spirit living in us. Romans 5, Paul writes, For if while we, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son, how much more... Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we have great confidence in his atoning sacrifice on the cross because he's demonstrated his power over even his own death in his resurrection. He showed it over other people's lives when he was living. But who can raise themselves from the dead? Only Jesus. Only he. And so we have assurance of our own resurrection in him because we trust in him. And like Martha, we say, yeah, Jesus, you, we put all of our hope in you. All of our hope is in you. Our whole foundation is just Jesus, what he's done for us, his disposition towards us. And the unity, the union we have in him. He told us about a resurrection. He demonstrates the resurrection uh, with people and then in today's passage with Lazarus. And then he shows even his own resurrection when he miraculously, wonderfully, gloriously comes back from the dead. Therefore, because of all these things, We live, we can live lives totally free of the fear of death. Changes how we view death, 
because we see even how Jesus says, but then how he's demonstrated that death is not the end. Although we live, although we die, we will yet live. And then he says, and, and anyone who believes in me won't die. So we look at death differently. Death has lost its sting, like the Old Testament and New Test- Testament authors write. It's still, still grievous. Like Jesus weeps with those who are weeping. Shortest verse in the Bible, it's in this chapter where his friends, like siblings to him, are crying and he joins them in their grief even though he knows what's coming next. And so too for us. We can grieve, but like Paul writes to the Thessalonians, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve as those for whom death has lost its sting because we're living in light of the resurrection today. It's the most wonderful, wonderful day. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus. They haven't treated us according to our sin. You've treated us according to Jesus' blamelessness, his spotless perfection, his wondrous works. So today, help us. Uh, we certainly want to live in light of who Jesus is and what he's done, in light of our debt being paid on the cross, us being ransomed to you, Jesus showing his victory over sin and death and every power and principality, even over all of creation. And we want to live in light of the resurrection that, like he rose from the dead, we too will rise from the dead in him, and that we live in light of the resurrection even now. Father, we don't want to just believe in these things as abstract kind of realities or distinct from who you are personally, but Father, we want to know you more. And so because of what Christ has won, please, Father, help us to have open hearts and minds to your voice as you speak words of life to us through your scriptures, through your spirit, through your church and your creation, that as you draw us to you, we will uh, unencumbered, untethered to anything else or any other love. We would, I mean, really run to you. Just to know you more, know your character more, know your love more, know your mercies more. Father, like those first disciples, Uh, who walked with no fear of death, likewise help us to live in light of the resurrection today. We pray this in Jesus' holy name and for his sake.